Let us stand for our call to worship. I lift my eyes to the hills where does my help come from. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us join together in our opening hymn. Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I want to welcome everybody uh, to our virtual worship service, so a, a real worship service being broadcast uh, via YouTube and on the internet. Uh, we continue to be uh, practicing very, very safe measures here at Raven Gap Presbyterian Church as uh, we continue uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, we have a large congregation and a very small, small building. So each month our session will be reviewing and uh, considering the, the opportunities and how we may restart worship and as soon as we can restart worship in person. We miss everyone and look forward to seeing everyone together very, very soon. 
Just uh, one announcement to highlight in the bulletin. It is the third week of the uh, month, so two big things happen. Our monthly session meeting will take place on Wednesday via social distancing, uh, but we will gather together uh, here and spread out in the church uh, for that meeting in person this time. We have Zoomed uh, since March, and I think we all need to see each other even if it is six to 10 feet apart. Also, our monthly food distribution. The third Saturday of each and every month, Raven Gap Presbyterian Church sponsors and hosts and provides over 40,000 pounds of food. Uh, we need volunteers between 18 and 59, healthy, no underlying health issues, no symptoms, no fevers. Uh, we have masks, uh, we have gloves. If you have a better mask than surgical mask, please wear those and bring those. Uh, when you're here, try, try your best to practice social distancing um, and work together with people you came with in your car, particularly your family on a station. If you come by yourself, push a car or be a loader. Um, that'll take place uh, next Saturday, beginning at 7.30 in the morning. If you are unable to come help, how, you can help in a different way. And we've been encouraging this in the, the weeks uh, and months past. Uh, come and uh, pick up food. Come get in line or come early. We will preload you. If you come before 7.30 in the morning, uh, we can uh, preload you to take and deliver food to a neighbor, uh, a coworker, a family member, a friend, uh, someone you may know of that has a need and doesn't have transportation or a vehicle to come, uh, or maybe uh, they're very proud or, or just uh, don't want to be seen in the line, but we want you to help them. You can do that. You come and we will take care of you and you can uh, take that food to, to them as a church member on behalf of the church. Uh, if you know someone who is in need that does have a vehicle and can come, tell them to please line up. Uh, uh, we move very quickly once we get going. Uh, we load things into truck beds and trunks. We do not put anything into cars or SUVs. People have to get out and do their own if it's going in the back seat of the car or into the back of an SUV or a van. We are doing everything we can to be safe and we know uh, there are risks, but we also know the need and uh, uh, the opportunity to provide food for families who are desperate in these economic difficult times in the midst of a pandemic uh, rely upon us each and every month. So I hope to see you uh, next Saturday morning. As we continue our worship, uh, say hello to those around you, show them a smile, wave, maybe if their family shake hands as we prepare for our children's message. Hello boys and girls. Today we're gonna learn from Paul a little bit more about the three great things that we need to know remain no matter what, which are faith, hope, and love. And we've talked about faith and its importance. We've talked about hope and how uniquely as Christians we know that hope isn't a wish, it's an expectation of things to come. Today we're going to talk about love, so I brought a couple things I love. I, I brought today for you to share Little Debbie Swiss Rolls and Coca-Cola. Now I probably love these a little too much and need to cut back, and I am trying to cut back. But there's nothing like a Little Debbie Swiss roll. It is the perfect cake in a box. And there is nothing like a ice cold Coca-Cola on a hot summer day, or let's be honest, there's nothing like a Coca-Cola in the middle of winter with a bowl of chili, at breakfast with a biscuit and eggs. Coke goes with everything. I love Coca-Cola. But did you hear how I just used the word? In English, our language, we have this word love, and this word love is used for all sorts of things. I love riding my bike. I love uh, math. I love Little Debbie's. I love Coca-Cola. I love my mother. I love my brother. Something's wrong there, isn't it? We probably should not use love as much. We probably should use like for things that we enjoy, we like to do, we like to be a part of, and save love. Save love for the really big things, for people and God, that we love God with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, 
and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. And when we truly, truly love, our lives will look different and the people who we come in contact with, the people who we love will feel and know the difference. Can we say a prayer together? Lord, help us to love bigger and grander and bolder. Help us to remember the power of the love of God and the importance of that word and that command for us to love one another. Help us, Lord, to love all the other children of God, each and every one, big and small, old and young, all colors, all places, all languages, all people. May we love the children of God as we are a child of God ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we know that you are a God of mighty power and you are a God of incredible grace. We as a country continue to be uh, torn and struggling on many, many fronts. We are challenged by a pandemic like the world has not seen in over a century that has continued to put lives at risk. We have lost over 100,000 people nationally. We have more than 2 million people who have caught and tested positive for this virus. We have healthcare workers just stretched to their limits. We have hospitals and medical supplies running as hard and as stretched as thinly as they can be. We also have an economic fallout from not being able to carry on with life as we normally do, to not be able to work, to travel, to uh, be able to go out to eat, to stimulate the economy by enjoying the things we like to do in places that we like to be. We also, Lord, are faced with a great reckoning, a very, very difficult look in the mirror and beginning to understand the need for social justice and reform, for doing better in our relationships, not only as individuals, but as groups, as communities, as states, and a nation. Lord, we pray for healing from the coronavirus. We pray, pray for strength to recover our economy. We pray, Lord, for grace, humility, and listening ears to hear our brothers and sisters who are in pain, who have suffered indignities, and who want what is equal for everyone, to be equal for everyone. Lord, we pray this day for our particular community and the struggles that we are in the midst of. We pray for our food distribution coming up next Saturday that we will not only have great food staples to fill pantries and refrigerators, but that we will provide dignity for all those in need that they deserve. Help us, Lord, to remember, to remember daily that we each and every one are children of God. May we show honor May we show respect. May we show politeness and kindness. And may we live out grace-filled lives as we have received the ultimate gift of grace that we did not deserve. We do not own. We did not work for it. It was a gift. May we live a life that is gracious and loving May we worship more regularly. May we live more faithfully. May we serve more eagerly. And may we give more generously. All in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now bring to God his tithes and our offerings.
you brought your Bibles with you today, turn to 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, the church that he founded and planted and cared deeply for. The church has started having some trouble, and as a result, he's writing to instruct them. They've kind of developed sort of a ego-driven pecking order of who is the uh, most spiritual those that have certain gifts think they're better than others. And Paul is writing a letter of correction. And in the midst of this corrective letter, he gives us this amazing chapter that is called simply the love chapter and known throughout the world. 1 Corinthians 13. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesize in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I put away childish ways. Now we see but a poor reflection, as in a mirror, dimly. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. We are all in need of it. To be loved, we are all in need of it. To be loved, and to love, that is. An old English rock band named Sweet that I had actually kind of forgotten about until I saw a story in the last week or so that their bass player passed away at the age of 72. How can it be that the rock stars of my childhood are 72? They had a few hits, Ballroom Blitz and Teenage Rampage maybe or something. One that I remember when I was maybe nine or 10 and at summer camp one summer was this song that had this incredibly profound line. It said, love is like oxygen. Too much, you get too high, not enough, and you're gonna die. There it is, says it all, that's it. We need love, we need love. Paul McCartney asked the question as he writes the song you think that people would have had enough of silly love songs? I look around me and I see it isn't so. Some people want to fill the world with silly love songs and what's wrong with that? I'd like to know because here I go. I love you. Paul and John had a little tension at that point. They had split up. The Beatles were over. And John saw himself more the radical, the poet, and saw Paul more dismissively as the love song writer. It was impossible to get a number of how many love songs that had been written. I tried, I really did try. I searched and I looked, I looked and I searched. I couldn't even find out how many love songs have been written since there have been records. Just a Spotify music search for love the list was thousands long. I got tired of just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. The end I never got to. I gave up. I gave up. So there are an unlimited amount of love songs written, recorded, 
and there are even more that have been written and not recorded, and there are even more that have been written and sung and no one knows they exist. Not to mention the whole opposite genre of songs. There might just be even more love songs that are actually about heartbreak and heart aches. Country music alone has elevated the brokenhearted song genre to elite status. I researched, I studied, I looked, I learned, and I learned that there are ways to write a love song. There are key pieces to writing your own love song. There are certain things that you always have to do and include. There are online guides, tutorials, videos, and step-by-step -step instructions. I'm not making this up. There is a site that said ways to write the perfect love song for songwriters. They gave you a few tips, helpful tips. Show your passion. It said love is a very powerful thing. It can bring out a passion inside of you that might not be part of your everyday life, but should be part of your song. Complexity. That the complexity of the music and the message should match. In other words, a simple story of I love you needs simple music, but a more complex story, say Wuthering Heights, needs complex music. Make it personal. Always make it personal. Everyone's definition of love is different, and you will not be able to appeal to everyone, it says. And this one I thought was hilarious, that of all subjects, of all things, it says, avoid cliches when possible. So much for roses are red, violets are blue. There was, to my surprise, even a love song generator. Now, a generator is an engine. It's a software program, whatever, that is going to take some things that you put in and sort of throw them up in the air, put them in place, and generate something. You know, think of a word, a word cloud. But this is a generator that generates songs, love songs in particular. So I, I thought in all, you know, sparing no expense for this sermon today, and to kind of go out on a limb that I would give it a try. So I began, I clicked and began on this love song generator. No idea how to tell your loved one how you feel. How about a love song, it ask? And then it begins to ask you questions. The name of the person whom this song is written. And it gives you titles. Mr. And Mrs. Ms. Mrs. Cheryl Barber. Four adjectives that could be described for that person. They give you examples like, and this is their examples. These are not my examples at all. Beautiful, insecure, smelly. I put vibrant, dynamic, loving, kind. Then it asks two vegetables that you like. It gives examples, potato and carrot. I put our two favorite vegetables, which are lady peas and Brussels sprouts. It asks your favorite animal. Well, we don't have pets. We don't have favorite animals. We like being pet friendly. My allergies appreciate it, and we don't have to be home at a certain time to let anyone or anything out. So I put cows. Now, Cheryl probably would disagree with me there as her favorite animal, but we have cows all around us here in Raven County, and you always see cows out in the pasture, and they always are beautiful out in the pasture, and they're even better on my plate. So I put for favorite animal, cows. It asked favorite type of food, like spaghetti, pizza, curry. I put lobster because Cheryl and I had just had a talk not long ago, how much she wished she could have lobster in the midst of all of this coronavirus shutdown. A condiment. A condiment you enjoy. They suggest ketchup or vinegar. This was the easiest question of all. I put mayonnaise. Cheryl is from Florence, South Carolina. She likes mayonnaise. She puts mayonnaise on everything. A hamburger, a BLT, Chick-fil-A, even a biscuit, and on French fries, which bothers me to no end, but she tells me that it's European, and I just don't understand. It asks something red. I can't remember what I put. Something blue. I think I put 
genes, something you love. I wrote Beckett. Beckett is our only grandchild. Our granddaughter who will turn two today, is two today, as you watch this uh, service and sermon. And Cheryl is with her for her second birthday. Cheryl loves her girls. Cheryl loves me. Cheryl loves Beckett. A verb, dancing, singing, I can't remember what I put. A part of the body, hands, legs, arms, I think I put eyes because Cheryl has magnificent, wonderful eyes. A glamorous job, I put the job she has. She's a teacher, a college counselor. A place where you may, may be found, um, and I put Raven because we live in Raven County. An object like flowers, pins, or keys, I, I don't remember what I put there. A season, I wrote summer because it is summer, and Cheryl always, each and every season, says, this one is my favorite. I push the button, write me a love song after I put all that information in, and in just about 15 seconds, boom, a love song appeared. Not only a love song, but the album cover to go with it. The love song titled for me to Cheryl was titled, Our Beautiful Lady Peas Kind of Love. This one's for you, Mrs. Barber, it says. And these are the words. I miss having you here because laughter would help. Even just a soundtrack like on Dick Van Dyke, but laughter would help. This is what the love song generator wrote. My love for you is like the most beautiful lady peas. Your face reminds me of vibrant cows. Together we are like lobster and mayonnaise. Oh, darling, Cheryl, my beautiful lady pea, my vibrant Brussels sprout, the perfect companion to my lobster soul. Lips are red and jeans are blue. I like Beckett, but not as much as I love singing with you. Oh, darling, Cheryl, your eyes are like mountains on a summer day. You're like the most teacher to ever walk raven. Your vibrant cow face, did not write that. Your mayonnaise soul, your eyes, your teacher being, how could I look at another when our beautiful Lady P love is so strong? I love you, Miss Barber. Now, in full disclosure, after it generated this, I immediately called Cheryl, told her what I did, sent her a picture and that it is in the sermon, and she laughed and said, why did you put cow? So here is a glance at some of the top love songs going back just a little bit. Let's do by decades, it might be more fun. I looked recently in the 2020-2019 range and after I excluded the crude, the inappropriate, the profane, I was left with digging deep and choosing my own three and I bet you haven't heard of a single one. The first is by a band called The Lone Below and it's called Enemies, not your normal title for a love song. But the song is about how often it tends to be opposites attract. Cheryl is very different from me. I am pretty good with isolation. I am an introvert. She is an extrovert. We have joked that in our marriage, she has brought me out of my shell enough to be human, and I have held her back enough from being arrested. Little Big Town, a band that has a connection locally is one of the Female members of the band is from Habersham County, Clarksville, and a friend of Ann Rickman. Their song this year, Next to You, is about new love and how exciting and wild it can be, but that long-term love is rare. It takes commitment, and that's what their song is all about. It's called Next to You. And then there's this song by Alan Stone. It's kind of a song about a guy writing his own vows, I guess, in a way. Alan's this quirky, odd, unique, gentle, uh, very sweet guy from the West Coast from, I think, Washington State. His song is called Consider Me. So if I go back a little further, searching for love songs, in the early 2000s, I would recommend Faith Hill, Breathe, or Nora Jones, Come Away With Me, maybe Crazy in Love by Beyonce, and let's throw out about 90% of everything Everything Michael Buble and Adele do are love songs. The 90s, hands down, the winner, 
It's Dolly's song. It's Whitney's voice. I Will Always Love You. Runner Up is Because You Love Me by Celine Dion. And honorable mention, I'm going to give From This Moment by Shania Twain. 1980s. The winner, I'm going to say Journeys faithfully. Honorable mention, I Want to Know What Love Is by Foreigner. The 1970s, great music, hard to pick, just one. But I'm going to say number one's going to be the Reverend, the right Reverend Al Green's Let's Stay Together. And then honorable mention to the Commodores, Three Times a Lady, and I'm going to throw all the votes I have in for Billy Joel, Just the Way You Are. The 1960s, this will be polarizing. You could go with Unchained Melody by the Righteous Brothers, or you could go with Marvin Gaye's How Sweet It Is to Be Loved by You. You could even, in the 1960s, squeeze in there with a little Elvis, I Can't Help Falling in Love, and about 50 Beatles songs. But this decade, the 60s, the best love song, I'm giving it to Miss Etta James at last. The 1950s, Amore by Dean Martin, When I Fall in Love by Nat King Cole, but I'm going to give this to the one I just snubbed in the 60s. I'm going to give it to Elvis and his great hit song, Love Me Tender. The 1940s, if any of you remember the music of the 40s, I didn't realize how much I knew about the music of the 40s and realized my dad loved the 40s music. That's what I grew up hearing at home whenever dad had control of the radio, the stereo, or the eight-track player. Imagination by Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, sung by Ella Fitzgerald. The 1930s, we're gonna go a tie. In the Mood by Glenn Miller, and Over the Rainbow by Judy Garland. We have but one word, one word, one word for the greatest gift God gave humanity in the English language, that is love love. And love, unfortunately, is not only the word we use for the greatest gift given by God that describes God's care for us and in those very special moments, our care, our love for someone else. We have this one word, love. This one word, love, that we also use to say, I love that movie. I love my new car. I love a meal at XYZ restaurant. I love, and I mean it when I say I love Coca-Cola and Little Debbie's. You have likely always heard that there are three words for love in the Greek language. Eros, meaning romantic love. Philios, meaning sisterly, brotherly love. And agape, godly love. In modern day Greek, and the language has evolved and changed from biblical Greek uh, that we read and learn in seminary. In modern Greek, it's a little confusing. I remember when we lived in Athens, actually, in specific, we lived in Glyphata, which is sort of the buckhead of Athens at the beach. Glyphata Square, standing on a hot summer night, hearing the, the beat and the sounds blasting out of an upstairs disco in the square and a singer singing agape su, meaning I love you. And even as a teenager, I knew enough from worship and Sundays and my dad that agape was about our love for God, God's love for us, and yet they were using it as a romantic word for love and very much not a godly reference for it. There are actually more Greek words for love. Variants and possibly subcategories aplenty. It's fascinating because we have one word, and I believe we do ourselves a disservice because of that. Love and life are interchangeable for us. Love has no category, no quantifier of the deepness, the richness, the power, the beauty. In the Greek language, agape means love, Particularly, it is used as a word for charity, and it describes the love for God and God's love for us. Agape is used throughout the Bible in the New Testament, and it is always talking about 
God's relationship to us. It is loving. And in response to that, we are called to, invited to, commanded to love God in return. Eros, that is that sensuous love, that passionate love, that love between a man and a woman. Philia, affectionate. It is where we get the word Philadelphia. It means brotherly or sisterly love, usually between equals. Story. It means love, affection, especially of a parent for a child. By Lucia, it means self-love, meaning that you regard and care about yourself and your own happiness. Xenia, it means guest or friendship love. Hospitality would be another way to explain it. Paul writes about love, or better yet, Paul defines love in powerful, beautiful, expressive, transformative language, action words, love as doing more than thinking or saying. In his letter to the Corinthians, in the midst of this uh, rebuke, this correction, this trying to guide a church out of controversy, in the midst of them all wanting to be a little spiritually above the next person, a little higher, a little better, a little bolder, a little greater. That is that stuff we have called sin. Paul addresses them in the midst of that conversation with this chapter about love. It is called the love chapter. Verse 4, he says, love is patient. Now Paul is going to do this with language that is uniquely beautiful. It is uniquely expressive. It is transformative. They are action words. Love for Paul is more about doing than thinking. But if you think it, you will be doing it. Love is patient. And an opposite way to think about that is love is not impatient. He says love is kind. So that means it's not unkind, inconsiderate, mean, or cruel. He says love does not envy. So that means it is friendly, it is comforting, it is celebrating others more than yourself. He says love does not boast. It is to be understated, self-deprecating. He says love is not proud. So if it's not proud, love is humble and it is modest. He says, love does not dishonor others. So, love shows honor always and respect. He says, love is not self-seeking. So that means it's altruistic, it is unselfish, it is generous. He says, love is not easily angered. So, it is calm, it is pleased, it is good-humored, it is peaceful, and it is peace-filled. He says, love keeps no record of wrongs. Pretty clear here. We'll add no keeping of records of what are right. Always and never I've learned in my 20 plus years in ministry in premarital counseling and marriage, marriage counseling, always and never are the two most dishonest words in our relationship vocabulary. They are never true. So don't say them, please. Love does not delight in evil. So that means love will delight in what is good. He says that love rejoices in the truth. So that means that love does not rejoice in dishonesty, falseness, lies, fictional accounts. He says love always protects. So love doesn't expose neglect, attack, or harm. He says love always trust. So that means love does not, not cause distrust, mistrust, or skepticism or doubt. He says love always hopes. Always hopes. And we just talked about last week the power of hope as Christians. Hope is not a wish. It is for us an expectation. 
Paul says love always perseveres. So love never gives up. Love never stops. Love never quits. And just to reinforce that, Paul says, love never fails. So it always succeeds. Love will always win. Love will always conquer and love will always prevail. Anthony Rasmussen, a writer specializing in the Beatles, made a list of their top love songs and of several of them I did not know and had not heard. Real Love, The Two of Us, Something, All My Loving, P.S. I Love You, When I'm 64 and I Love Her, I Want to Hold Your Hand, If I Fell, and the number one, Yesterday. Of course, there are many, many, many more truly great songs which could easily have been included on that list. Love in its many forms was such a central theme in so much of the Beatles' repertoire. We'll include 10 more on another day. Just let me know what your favorite one is. One he left out that surprised me, that got me thinking about the Beatles in the first place, was All You Need Is Love. You know it's a very simple song. You know it. Love, love, love. Love, 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 love. There's nothing you can do that can't be done. There's nothing you can sing that can't be sung. There is nothing you can say, but you can learn how to play the game. It's easy. Nothing you can make that can't be made. No one you can save that can't be saved. Nothing you can do, but you can learn how to. Be, in, be you in time. It's easy. All you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love. Love is all you need. You know that song and how it goes on and on and on about all you need is love. Love is all you need. Love, love, love. Love is all you need. 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 I counted. I counted. 62 times. 62 times. Love is sung to reinforce it, to make the point. All you need is love. Love is all you need. The Apostle Paul is less repetitive in 1 Corinthians 13, but he's just as clear. In fact, you might be surprised that there are 686 times the word love appears in the Bible. 425 of those will shock you. 425 times the word love appears in the Old Testament. Now, most folks would think that the Old Testament was more about judgment and punishment and all sorts of negative, harsh things. The people are scattered. The people return. They are invaded on and on and on. And yet, 425 times. In the Old Testament, we find the word love. So, 425 from 686, that leaves 261 times in the New Testament. Kind of tells you what matters, doesn't it? Deuteronomy 6.5 from the Old Testament says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That is complete. That is total mind, body, and spirit. It is also a child's catechism way to sum up all of the Law and the Prophets, the Ten Commandments. The first four are about our relationship to God. The second six are all about our relationship to one another, to simplify, to know, to be able to repeat and remember you are called to love God and to love your neighbor. John 3.16, maybe the most famous passage of Scripture that there is. It's always disconnected from the next verse, which together would be my theology of ministry. John 3.16 and 17 says it this way, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Don't forget
forget. Don't forget this passage of our scripture today. 1 Corinthians 13. Don't forget how it starts. Before it gets to that list of what love is and what love isn't, it has a very interesting starting point. If I, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Let's look at the if I's. Let's take out, let's, let's condense this a little bit. If I do not have love, I am nothing but a bunch of noise. If I do not have love, I am nothing at all. If I do not have love, gain nothing. Let's turn it a little different. Let's hear it the way we need to hear it. Maybe when we read it and, and read Paul's words, if I, we set those on Paul and we set that as a standard that applies to him and him alone and it's not up to us and that's not what he's doing at all. He's telling us. He is speaking the words of God to us that we need to hear, especially right now, about love. If you, if you do not have love, you are nothing but clanging bells, pots and pans, honking horns, a distraction. If you, if you do not have love, you are nothing. If you, if you do not have love, you have gained nothing, you have learned nothing, you have nothing. The book Love Story gave the world the memorable line, Love is never having to say you're sorry. Not true. Worst line ever in any book. Turned into a film and memorialized by people saying it a million times since. It's not true. In my experience as a human, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, love is about saying you're sorry. If you love someone, you will say you're sorry. Love is not about getting. It is not about taking. Love is not about what I want or what I need. Love is about giving. It is not always a yes, but it is always a how-to. Love is realizing. Love is realizing how much you would have missed, how much less your life would have been without it. Or without them. Love is knowing God loved you first. And because of that, you can love one another. Nothing else matters. When all is said and done, only three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let us stand together for our closing hymn.
God loved you first. In the power of your baptism, you were prayed for that you would never know a moment in your life where you did not know the love of God. Because you know you are loved, you know you must show love. You must love God and you must love your neighbor. Remember, all you need is love. Love is all you need. And Christ demonstrated his love in giving his life for us all so that we, we may live freely and forever together in love. Now may the grace of our Heavenly Father, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and may the love of Christ be with you and upon you all, both now and forevermore.